Good afternoon and welcome to the second Monday, which is the third Monday. We're scheduling this by continuing resolution. <laughs> uh, but we do plan to go back to the schedule of the second Monday in uh, November and December. Let me uh, begin by introducing our uh, special guest today. He is uh, John Harwood, and I'm going to read, I'm going to introduce him in three ways. Uh, the first way is to read uh, what the publicist says. And then I want to say a word and I'm going to ask somebody else to say a word. First, the official bio. John Harvard is Chief Washington Correspondent of CNBC and a political writer for the New York Times. Harvard was born in Louisville, Kentucky and grew up in the Maryland suburbs outside of the nation's capital. He has been around journalism and politics all his life. His first trip on a presidential campaign press plane came when he was 11 years old and accompanied his father, then a political reporter for the Washington Post. And actually, I found elsewhere that uh, John was early into uh, political campaigning. Uh, he campaigned for Bobby Kennedy uh, because he was in a picture, I believe. He was in a photo of his race. There's a television commercial that my mother and how old were you at that time? Uh, that was the same year, I was 11 years old. But he went a different direction. While still in high school, he began his journalism career as a copy boy at the Washington Star. He studied history and economics at Duke University and graduated Magnuson Law from there in 78. In 1989, Harvard was named an Eman Fellow at Harvard University, where he spent the 89-90 academic year in 91. He joined the Wall Street Journal as White House correspondent and was covering the administration of George H. W. Bush. Later, Harvard reported on Congress in 97 and became the journal's political editor and chief political correspondent. He writes the newspaper's political column, Washington Wire, and oversees the Wall Street Journal NBC News Poll. In 06, he joined CNBC as Chief Washington Correspondent. In addition to CNBC, Harvard offers political analysis on Week Press and Washington Week in Review, among many other television and radio programs, and has covered five presidential elections. There's the official one. The other thing I want to say, John, is that you're one of those people on television that I always listen to, and one of the people I always read, so it's kind of balanced, non anxious commentary on the base events, and I appreciate that very much. But I also want uh, Michael Curry to say a word about the, the part of John you may not know. I'm going to grab the microphone. There you go. David, turn your mic. David, turn your mic off for a moment. It's hard to ask. That is hard to ask. Um, I'll tell you a little story because I know John Herbert very well and from that introduction, actually, knowing him in a variety of ways. His father, as mentioned, was my first boss, Dick Harwood, who was then the editor of the Trenton Times when I thought I was going to be a journalist. And Dick Harwood, among other things, taught me I probably was not cut out to be a journalist. I probably had to go into politics as a less noble profession. So uh, that was one contribution. But I can also say that. Those of you who are familiar with political lore will appreciate this. I trusted my wife to go on a trip on the Appalachian Trail with John Harvey, <laughs> which is a true story because um, John and my wife have been very active in a ministry called the Wilderness Trail, which has been started by his family through his in-laws. And they go off together and camp with youth groups on the uh, Appalachian Trail. So uh, he was a chaperone with my wife on a group that my son has been a part of. And uh, they have, we've gotten to know each other very well through that. In fact, he was at my house Saturday night for exactly that. I can kind of on the personal side reflect on John Howard as someone who is a very committed uh, Christian, uh, someone who I think thinks about values and the things that matter in our public life and how those issues get addressed in our public realm. Uh, he's enough of a cynical, hard-bitten reporter to know that those are not always the issues of the day, but uh, he's someone who brings a great deal of grace and value to the way in which he reports on politics, but sometimes lacks both of those. So um, it's a great pleasure, and thank you for being with us at Wesley Seminary. Thank you.
time the when the hey, can I respond for one second? <laughs> <laughs> so it, it was even more pointed than Mike was suggesting because the um, week before I went with Deborah McCurry to chaperone the youth group uh, on the Appalachian Trail is when Mark Sanford, the governor of South Carolina, was busted for having an affair with somebody, having told the press that he was hiking on the Appalachian Trail. <laughs> And so when I was on TV before leaving on this trip, uh, one of the anchors said to me, um, so I understand you're going to be gone next week. Where are you going? I said, I'm hiking the Appalachian Trail. <laughs> I was like, ha ha, that's funny. What are you really doing? And um, so it was, uh, uh, that, was, that was bizarre. Um, thank you guys for having me here just before we end the conversation. I'm, I'm always grateful to be um, to ask to speak to groups like this, especially when I remember the way I started the business. I, I started as a reporter for the St. Petersburg Times, which is a very good paper, um, but not terribly well known nationally. And I remember my first campaign that I covered was 1984. Ronald Reagan was running for re-election. Uh, Mike's candidate, John Glenn, faltered in the drive to the nomination. And, uh, um, they told all of us on the White House press corps that we were going to a black tie fundraiser for Ronald Reagan at the Central Park Hotel in Los Angeles. At that time, I only owned one dark suit. And I packed the dark suit, flew out to California, went to this fancy fundraiser, and was you know, really impressed by, the, by all the big shots who were, who were there raising money for the president. And I go into the restroom, and I'm washing my hands, and I grab a towel right as one of these wealthy guys in a tuxedo walks by. And as soon as I pick up the towel, he says, uh, no thank you. <laughs> so, right where you came from. Oh, that's servant leader. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, when we uh, first uh, scheduled this uh, conversation, uh, we, we knew that the fruitful topic would be the mix of religion and politics in the upcoming presidential election. Uh, we didn't know how it was going to come up. Uh, last time, uh, we had the Jeremiah Wright issue. We had uh, one of the Republican primary candidates, a Baptist minister, Islam got into the discussion. In the previous election, from the politicians got in, and now between the time we scheduled this and today, uh, the issue of uh, Romney's uh, Mormonism has come into the picture. But what, what do you think if you now look ahead to the next uh, cycle of the Lord of the Time? What, what's the next one look like? Well, I think the Mormon uh, issue is interesting not only because of Ben Romney, you have John Huntsmith, who's another um, uh, Mormon from Utah, former governor running, very similar characteristics to, to Romney. I have always been skeptical of the idea that that was going to be all that detrimental to Romney. Um, for this reason, uh, yes, it is true that a significant number of uh, evangelical uh, Christians, especially in the South, um, had negative views about Mormonism. You know, the, the fellow who introduced uh, Rick Perry at a recent event described Mormonism as a cult. Um, that, that's correct, but I think for a couple of reasons the impact of that on this campaign is going to be reduced. One is that um, this is an election that is dominantly focused on economic issues. And so the degree to which social issues move in discussion, even with people who have those feelings, is diminished. That plays to, to Romney's advantage. Um, it will have some impact in some states, South Carolina, for example, uh, is one place where it could be factored. When you look beyond, though, uh, Mitt Romney has a lot of advantages in the Republican race. If you look beyond that to the general election, the places where that could occur to are places where um, he's likely to do very well by virtue of being a conservative Republican in the race against the Democratic president in a very polarized election. So 
I don't see that as being a, um, uh, a tremendous influence on the race. Um, I think because of the privacy and economic issues, taxes, spending, growth, unemployment, the role of faith overtly is going to be diminished in the race. Although I think there's an interesting challenge for Obama that's sort of a social issue reflection of a similar kind of dynamic on, on pure economic uh, issues is that Democrats have done increasingly well over the last several election cycles with more secular voters, less frequently than Republicans have done well with the opposite. Um, Obama needs to continue uh, to do well with those voters, especially high income, less church going voters in metropolitan areas, uh, because that's that's the area of growth and the area of growing strength in the coalition. But how do you balance that with the need to um, to emphasize other parts of his personality, other parts of his agenda is, is going to be a challenge. I think one of the reasons why Obama is in so much stronger shape than the economic data would suggest is that people approve of his values. He, he's managed through the way that he has talked and presented himself as a, a husband and father uh, when Michelle Obama has come over, uh, gone over to the American public. He's, he has um, deepened the reservoir of goodwill for him as a person, and that is some for, uh, for him giving me the How do you think uh, Romney should handle the farming? Should he handle it at all? Should he do something like a Kennedy speech? Uh, should he do something like an Obama speech? What do you think he should go with that? Well, he did a Kennedy speech in 2007 uh, when he was running for the Republican nomination that time. I think his attitude this time is to play down those issues. Um, generally speaking, the other thing that I was going to say about Romney and Faith and Mormonism is that I think Americans like candidates who project strong values. And so to some degree, religiosity is a proxy for values. And I think that is I think the positive aspect of that is less, is greater than the negative associated with a specific denomination like Mormonism. Um, so to that degree, it is, uh, I, I think it's a, a problem that is less severe than some people have thought. But in addition to that, Romney's strategy, generally speaking, is to stay away from social issues, which are mixed blessings for different reasons. Uh, uh, Mormonism may be one way in which social issues are an explicit because of the uh, potential fallout of some segment of the Republican electorate. But the other problem for him is that he's seen as inauthentic on these issues because of the way his positions have changed. So the more he can take that sphere, which is nothing but trouble for him, and get to a conversation about economics and whatever expertise he brings to the idea of turning around the economy, is a way for him both to play with strength and hurdle over his weaknesses. Hugh uh, spoke several times now about the, the values question. I, I think in the column in late spring, you cited Mitch Daniels, uh, pleading that uh, there be a truce on the social values question in the uh, national debate. Do you think that's possible? Yes. Uh, the values, there are various ways in which the values debate can be propelled in the campaign. Who's on offense and who's not? I think Republicans recognize that because of the mood of the country um, and what Americans perceive as their biggest problem, that they're going to do best like Mitt Romney by focusing on, on the economy. And they have a, a party-wide version of Romney's issue for somewhat of a different reason, not an authenticity problem, but a priorities problem. And uh, you also have the phenomenon that public opinion has moved, continues to move, away from the conservative Republican direction on some key issues. Gay marriage, for example, is more popular than it was 
40 years ago, 80 years ago. Um, the issue of gay rights generally, gays in the military. Uh, the, the public, I believe, is on a continuous and long-term sort of drift toward greater and greater politics, which over time uh, is to the benefit of the democratic position on those issues. Um, so I think you're likely to see the administration, you've seen the president in some of his uh, fundraising speeches, um, hit Republicans for their stance on those issues. Um, and I, I think that's because uh, at the time when the economy's been, he's looking for tools. Because uh, he doesn't have much to talk about on the economy as he might in different circumstances. So, the Republican interest, generally speaking, is to say those issues which may turn off well-educated suburban, college-educated suburban voters uh, because their attitudes are different from ours, uh, we can talk to them about taxes, we can talk to them about economic growth. All those, I think, are uh, what Mitch Daniels, Mitt Romney, other Republican strategists think is a more promising conversation. If it's a binary choice from you're either talking about social values or you're talking about economics, what happens when, how do other values get into the conversation? So for instance, uh, compassion or uh, liberty, fairness, all of those are, are the values kinds of words that might be the way into the conversation and perhaps uh, gay rights or abortion or not? Um, I think definitely those values are going to make their way into the conversation. The question is who benefits from that. Um, in different times and different uh, sort of particular political matchups, the uh, net positive or negative can vary. Compassion and fairness in some elections has worked against Democrats because it has been perceived by other uh, voters as um, special pleading at the expense of the strength and vitality of the economy as a whole. And I think that is an argument that Republicans will make. The, you've got a real um, direct trade-off in the discussion about taxation. The President has proposed as a way of financing some of his um, Proposals to create jobs and, and uh, direct government uh, toward payroll tax cuts. He wants to pay for those by raising taxes on people at the top of the spectrum. Um, the argument from conservatives is that that would damage the economy and growth and vitality of uh, America's economic engine and hurt everybody. Democrats say no, uh, it won't, but, but at root, it's a fairness and justice kind of argument. So there you're going to have those two um, dimensions pitted against one another. The public opinion polling would suggest that the president has the high side of the issue because when we've seen in our NBC Wall Street Journal polling consistently, people want taxes raised on those at the top. But that doesn't always translate into um, A, effective action in Congress because there's a difference between what shows up in the public opinion poll and how members of Congress vote. And it is also possible, and we've seen this in, in many elections, that people may agree individually on some issues with, uh, with the candidate on one side, but in the totality of the impression they draw of um, the, the effect of the other side, that somebody conveys greater strength, a greater sense of direction, a greater sense of leadership, you, they can get past individual issues on which they're on the short stop. We don't know how that's going to play out. There are some, when these questions come up, who say religion ought not to have any voice in uh, something that is uh, important. To me, that doesn't make any sense because I think an election, an election needs to be about what the priorities of people in society are. And 
religion, even, even if mainstream denominations, Methodist Church, for example, uh, are, have lost strength over recent decades, for most people, religion still plays a significant role in their lives. And so it informs their value choices, it informs um, the way they spend their time, the way they raise their kids, their aspirations for um, themselves, their families, their neighborhoods, their community. And so if candidates can't speak to those shared aspirations, they're not speaking to, um, to voters. Now, that doesn't necessarily translate into particular prescriptions about how, how in a tangible way Religion ought to factor into the public sphere, but the faith of candidates that they have a faith, I think, is important. You know, you um, we talked about Mormonism a second ago, and you, you think about barriers to uh, uh, political advancement that have been shattered over the years. Ronald well, Reagan was divorced. Got like John Kennedy was a Catholic. Joe Lieberman was on the national ticket as a Jew. My belief, for the same reason I said what I said about Mormonism, I don't think that was a, a negative for the Democratic ticket because Joe Lieberman was associated with values and that identification came significantly out of his faith. Um, and I, I think on that, Mitt Romney will just do fine with the Mormon question. When will we see a president who professes no faith? No time soon. shots of the president entering the church on Sunday, or the candidate entering the church on Sunday morning, would there be there? Absolutely, it would be there. Um, I, I think that would be, um, <coughs> if we are on a, a long march toward increasing acceptance of different uh, candidates with uh, different demographic backgrounds and different characteristics, I think a, uh, a, a candidate of no faith will be one of the last barriers. To be uh, breached at the There was a memorial service here a couple of weeks ago, the Metropolitan Methodist. And it was a memorial service for Chuck Knapp. Many of the people in this room remember Chuck, who was a very active Democratic uh, politician, very involved in the uh, electoral reform of that. Uh, of that party. But what was striking about that service uh, was that, first of all, Frank Ferencock was the uh, leading of the service. But also the room was not divided, it was a mix of people who were both red and blue. Uh, it seemed, though, to be a picture of the way Washington used to be. Or it's a picture of what Washington looks like on Sunday morning. It's probably the most integrated hour politically on Sunday morning uh, is at 11 o'clock in Washington area churches. <coughs> uh, well, let's say you're a pastor of one of those churches. What's your role in that setting? Is it to have a, a, a safe narthex and coffee hour? Uh, what? How do you address issues from the pulpit? No, I think that's that's a very individual decision based on the, the uh, strength of view of the pastor and, and what he sees his role as. But I, but I think the the point that you make is a good one about Washington on Sundays. The problem is, from the standpoint of how how could that um, that reality of a mix of people. How could that translate into uh, greater progress in the political system that we've seen? Problem is that if you're talking about members of Congress, they're not here. Like, that may occur where they go to church in their hometown, but it doesn't occur in Washington because unlike when I grew up here, um, which was a time, I went to school with the children of uh, Democratic and Republican members of Congress and House and Senate. Uh, now it's become so uh, uh, unpopular to, have, to be in Washington because Washington itself is so unpopular that people um, avoid it. 
Uh, I did a book in 2008 in which I interviewed many wise people, including Michael Frick. Um, but one of the stories we, we told in the book was, to me, revealing of something that if you multiply it by 10,000, uh, it, it tells you something about why we don't work the way we could. Um, there's a congressman, Jim McCreary from Louisiana, who was a uh, the ranking Republican member of the Ways and Means Committee. But like most members of Congress, he lived in uh, Shreveport uh, in Louisiana, his own district. His wife was uh, an educator, and she was a college professor in Shreveport, and his kids were in school down there. And over time, they became really weary of his commute, which caused him to be away from his family so much. So he was all set to retire, even though it looked like uh, he was in line to become the next chairman of that committee, which was a career aspiration of his. They made the decision to retire from Congress and move back. And one day he said he was driving into the Capitol from his little apartment that he had in suburban Virginia, and his wife called up and said, I've been praying about this and thinking about this. I have decided we're going to move to Washington because I want you to be the chairman of the Ways and Means Committee. I want you to have that opportunity that you want to do. So the family uh, sold their house in Shreveport. They moved to Washington. They ended up on the street uh, with a Democratic member of Congress from Texas. And their kids started going to Cub Scouts and play soccer on the same team together. And for several election cycles, McCreary had participated in raising money to defeat this Democratic member of Congress um, because that's what people do in Congress. They, they, uh, they take partisan sides and to the extent you have some clout, you raise money and you try to beat the other guys. And he said he was standing on the sidelines while his kids were like passing the soccer ball to each other and he said, no, I'm not going to try to beat his dad. I'm just not. And he told the leadership that he wasn't going to do that. Uh, he wasn't going to participate in that fundraising. Um, and I thought that was really interesting because it was simply the experience of being there. I don't know if they went to church together, he didn't say so, so I, I'm guessing they didn't. But the fact that those human ground level exchanges don't occur in church, in, in uh, you know, civil society, is one, one of the reasons why it's easy to demonize the other side and be in this sort of endless war. Yeah. And that? Say more about your upbringing. Well, I am a rare person here in Washington. I was born in Louisville. Uh, I moved to Washington when I was five with my family. Uh, my dad worked for the Louisville Courier Journal, uh, and he was shipped to Washington to cover the exciting new president, John F. Kennedy. And so we moved to suburban uh, Maryland, Chevy Chase. I went to um, local uh, public schools, um, Somerset Elementary, West Virginia High, that's the Chevy Chase High School. Um, I went to Duke to college afterwards, and I wanted to, to join us and myself. Um, I was raised in a Christian but secular and practice household. We didn't go to church very often. Um, and the I think there were some complicated familiar reasons for that. My, my Dad's um, father was a minister um, and was not the best role model. Uh, and so I think that had an influence on my dad and how he self organized religion. Um, and you also had sort of dad working, mom working, busy lives, four kids. That wasn't a part of my life. But I married into a Methodist family that uh, had a much different. Approach, and through that, that experience deepened my faith and, and um, uh, uh, influenced in a substantial way how we raised our children. Uh, and that's sort of how we ended up at St. Paul's because we were looking around for uh, the best church environment for the kids. And Mike said, uh, you know, come across St. Paul's, and it was head and shoulders above what we were experienced before. Um, so I, I found over time that uh, uh, faith and the church has played an increasing role in my life. 
you're sitting in church on Sunday morning and uh, there's a bill before Congress in the next couple of weeks on um, just pick a topic immigration. Uh, should the if the pastor has feelings about it one way or the other, how do you think those should how should that come out of the poll? Well, I don't see anything wrong with um, j just as I think Every human being is influenced by their value set in the thousands of choices we make every day. Um, and every politician, when, when he or she approaches trade-offs between uh, what's fair, what's effective, what's right, is informed by the values and, and, uh, and, and much of that will come from their faith and their upbringing. Uh, I, I don't see anything wrong with um, pastors expressing themselves. It's sort of a, it depends on the tone that they want to set within their church, and the you know pastors have to play a little politics too to figure out what what uh, will be appealing to the broadest uh, um, group within their congregation. But um, I, I think in principle, it's it's not only um, uh, not wrong, but it's it's right to do that. Um, and one of the problems, I think, if you take a Democratic perspective, Mike has been one of the leaders within the Democratic Party, figuring out ways to talk more effectively about faith because of some of the trends that I've talked about, where, where Republicans have become identified as the as the party of religious faith to a much greater degree than Democrats, a lot of Democrats have assumed it's sort of toxic to talk about those issues because you're going to offend people. Um, and I think that has been a barrier for Democrats reaching voters that they might otherwise uh, be able to reach. You have written uh, on politics, but you've also written a lot of economics. Writing there is captured my attention in recent days. Let me try to bring a question home. Are your children going to have it better than you did? Um, boy, th this is a, bit, a bad time to ask because um, it feels it's a very sour time in Washington and it's sort of a gloomy time economically. Um, if you take the long view and look at the economy and the society that we built since World War II, since people like my dad came home, they came home to a um, to a an economy that was not just unscathed by the war, but booming, where essentially all of our international competition had been crippled. So we had a dominant economy. We had uh, uh, GIs come home to go to college, raise the sort of productivity level of the workforce, and all of those factors produce a huge growth in the American middle class, suburbanization of the country. Then when you when you got into the 1960s and 70s, when we faced increasing competition, the rest of the world got at speed for our existence. Um, we had some things that uh, tended to um, uh, keep us buoyant, even though we were, in relative terms, uh, losing ground to the rest of the world. Women entered the workforce. Uh, they uh, provided many, many households with two incomes instead of one. So even though the uh, incomes of males flatlined, was not increasing, they had a second paycheck. When you got through the 70s and 1980s, you had, uh, we got into the, the uh, uh, Clinton era in the 1990s, yet uh, the economy seemed to take off. You had an internet uh, stock market boom. You had a real estate boom that followed that, all of which provided sources of financing for people to continue consuming at rates, even though we were facing this tremendous competition. Well, now the stock market bubble is gone. The real estate bubble is gone. The way in which people finance their lifestyles has, the, the props have been knocked out from under that. 
And now we're left with an economy where we've got tremendous pressure internationally uh, that has the effect of depressing the wages of average people. And no clear way to uh, transition fast from a demand-driven consumer economy to one where we innovate, produce things that the rest of the world wants to buy more than we want to buy their stuff. So it's a pretty daunting economic picture. I think people, uh, the kids of upper middle class families who go to good schools and develop skills and work hard are still going to have the opportunity to do fine. But generally speaking, I think the outlook, when you add on top of all that, the debt that we've accumulated, the fact that people like me are going to be retiring, getting our Social Security and Medicare, the number of kids behind us is small relative to uh, the number of people who are going to be added onto the system. It's um, it's depressing. I'm <laughs> picture <laughs> Sorry. Oh, darn. <laughs> Well, take that back then to the, the question about the next presidential cycle. Uh, it seems to me American politics has always been about the belt, or it has in our lifetime been about the belt. Uh, famous uh, in the Reagan election, are things that are, are you better off now than four years ago? So the delta is just a four year delta. We really see progress in four years. Now, if you take the delta out to a lifetime, uh, will your children be better off? Will your grandchildren be better off? That seems like it's a a way of it's a shorthand way of talking about the American dream. I, I don't think that's always been the American dream, but in our lifetime, that's the way the political class is defined. That we're constantly getting better off. Is it time to reconfigure the American dream? Um, good question. And what might people of faith have to say about what the dream is? Well, if, if part of the reconfiguring of the dream uh, involves a diminishment of the emphasis on um, consumption of material goods, uh, who's to say that's not a good thing? Might be a good thing. Um, as you said, in our lifetimes, that is how people have defined the truth. Bigger house, more stuff, better car, all that, uh, all of the um, things in the material world. Um, for every action and everything that happens in the public realm, you, or, or in people's everyday lives, there's a reaction. And if, in fact, people recalibrate, because they do, based on the reality of their lives, recalibrate their expectations, they could be turning to other things. In terms of the Delta, looking forward to 2012, the president's already said, he said the other day in an interview, that the Delta is not positive. People are not better off in four years ago. They want to make, the Democrats and the White House want to make the Delta a three-year Delta, because when they took office, we were shedding 700,000 jobs a month, and they are going to try to emphasize that we're, we're not losing jobs, we're gaining jobs, we have been for 30 months in a row in the private sector, it's just a very small number of jobs. And we fell into this hole, and we're coming out, but we're still in the hole. And we're, we're coming up very slowly. That's a hard argument to make, and Republicans have an easier story to tell about the economy, even if you know, the interesting thing about uh, Obama's ratings and the administration's ratings, they're uh, weak, they're not terrible, they're weak. He gets punished for economic performance and people's perception of how we're doing economically. But if you ask him the poll question, who is responsible for the economic situation we're in, still many more people say, uh, the previous administration than this one. Um, in my, to my way of thinking, it's it's more than either of those things. It's not Bush or Obama. It's the way the society has developed or not developed economically over a series of decades. So 
it's possible that people will absorb a deeper reality than a, you know, a blame choice that you give them on a poll question. But uh, Obama's going to try, going to have to count on people believing that he's fighting for them, that he is making some progress for them. It's not all futility. And that the destination that we'll arrive at if we follow his policies is going to be better. Um, because if, if, it's a, if it's a more immediate decision, it's not going to be a good one. I can see lots of questions forming in the room. And I wanted to give a lot of time for those questions. I believe we have a roving microphone. He's asking a preacher to turn his microphone off. Um, I do not see Helen Thomas in the room, so we'll go with whoever would like to ask. Bob? We need you to speak into this so we can capture the setup. Thank you very much for your remarks at a very timely moment. Uh, you've known a lot of uh, elected officials in your time. Uh, could you think of one or two whose faith has enhanced their ability to do their job? Well, I think everyone that I know who has been an effective public servant has to some degree rooted their faith in um, root rooting their public decisions in their faith. I'll, I'll give you one example in particular that I think of. And he's somebody that I became exposed to very early in my career. I covered his presidential campaign when he ran for president again. Mike's candidate in 1984. He was a very bad presidential candidate, but he was a very good governor. His name was Ruben Askey. And he was, um, uh, he was a Baptist. He was known in Florida for, uh, he, he was a teetotal. Um, but the real stand-up moment, I think, there were a series of things that Askey did that were bold in the context of the state of Florida when he was governor. He was, um, he was pro civil rights. Um, he was for uh, changing the uh, system of taxation and uh, political, political patronage in Florida that had uh, vested a tremendous amount of power in rural interests to, uh, which in his view retarded the development of the state. Um, but he took a stand. There was a um, uh, there was a move on the ballot to have casino gambling for the state of Florida. And he um, campaigned against that even though the state very badly needed the revenue. And it was a, really a, a uh, pretty direct sort of value choice between one side saying we're going to have more money for our schools if we pass this program. We had on the other side uh, ask you campaigning on it purely on the basis of the fact that he was wrong, that he felt it was wrong. And, um, that doesn't mean that he was right in that choice, but I, but it was a it was a very direct application of the what his faith told him to do, and he won the fight. He lost it long run uh, because we've seen the way states have become increasingly dependent on, um, on gambling revenue. But I thought that's one example that comes to mind. Uh, let me just uh, conclude by thanking 